Hello everyone, it's Shane Kanto, your Wasteland reviewer, and it's that time of the every other week, except slightly delayed this time, we have the Development Hell podcast. Alex is here and Matt is here. We're going to be talking about animated films today, and before going into our top three animated films, we have a couple of upcoming features to be talking about to see if we're going to send them back to Development Hell, or we're going to green light them, or maybe just lose them on our desks somewhere because I feel like that one's become pretty common when we've been talking about some of these movies so if you guys are ready I'm gonna I have a little list I'm trying to keep it relatively short but there are some big name films coming out over the next couple weeks so starting with the weekend of the 11th which will be the next weekend after we post this video is the new a24 film Minari which is about a Korean family who immigrates to America into the Midwest and it is about their experiences coming over here and living their lives so is A24 enough for either of you two so Alex does this yeah. one pique your interest sure sure I, I, I would green like that because I, I've seen the films I've seen from them are always different and compelling so yeah all righty. How about you, Matt? Yeah, why not? <laughs> <laughs> I don't. I don't know if I have the story didn't get me as much as like the company that's, I guess that's like fostering it. So yeah, but uh, yeah, why not? Let, let's see what's going on. Wait, who's uh, where? Where people? Where can people watch it? Is it like a Hulu thing? Like where can people watch? I it? think this one's technically coming out in limited release in theaters first. I'm not quite sure when it's going to be available on VOD though. Got you. Which realistically is probably where most people are going to see it, but it's not on any, it's not a streaming service film. So it is just A24 producing it. So, and it gets my green light. I've been hearing a lot of buzz about it, and it seems to be one of the films that they're really pushing for the Oscars this year, which they just announced that they intend on having a live in person ceremony really? for the Oscars, which is. Very interesting, even if they're probably not even allowed to do it because California is like under like stay at home orders, but whatever. The Oscars aren't until April now, so they pushed it back two months. But sure. this one seems to be getting a lot of buzz. All righty. It wouldn't be Netflix if it wasn't a Ryan Murphy creative project. So, Ryan Murphy, who did, let's see. American Horror Story, American Crime Story, Pose, Hollywood, a whole bunch of other stuff, the new Ratchet film and show on Netflix. He has a new film called The Prom, and this is a new musical starring Nicole Kidman, Meryl Streep, James Corden, and it's about a bunch of theater people who go to the Midwest to put on a prom in a very conservative town. So it's big, it's flashy, and it has music. So, Alex, does that catch your attention? I'd hate to just send it back because, I mean, it could be a very enjoyable film. It could be a fun time. But if it's just me as an individual, I'm going to send it back. Not a big musical person? Typically, no. Every once in a while, I'm surprised. So. Maybe this one will, but we're going to find out because it comes out I believe it comes out, I think, on the 11th on Netflix. So how about you, Matt? I refuse to find out. No, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, I think that's Matt's answer. But I, Yeah, I mean, I don't know. That, that kind of sounds like a, is it flash dance? Where there's like somebody, somebody that's like using a dancing to fight, to fight like conservative people or... That's foot, that's Footloose, Matt. Footloose. Get your 80s Footloose. movies right. Flash dance. <laughs> flash dance. Isn't she like a steel mill worker who wants to be like a dancer or something like that? I'm pretty sure that's the premise to Flash Dance. <laughs> Never saw the whole thing. <laughs> so <laughs> that's the that's the review right there. <laughs> I've never seen the whole thing. <laughs> Um, I'm, I'm not watching that. No, it, it doesn't sound interesting. It, it's interesting that only thing interesting about it when you said James Corden, I was like, oh wait, what about all those jokes that are uh, cats were going to ruin everyone's career? I guess, I guess everyone's 
Well, Everyone here's the thing. Like um, he's getting a ridiculous amount of heat for gay face. Because apparently he's a gay character who's just being ridiculously over the top flamboyant. Which Whoops. James Corden is not gay. So wait, but isn't of... it nineteen isn't nineteen like forty right now? Or oh wait, no. Oh wait, it's <laughs> wait, aren't we making breakfast at Tiffany's and we need an Asian character? Let's get Mickey Rooney. So yeah, please, please cancel me. Please. You won't do it. You won't do it. <laughs> so I've seen plenty of articles already about the prom specifically saying that like James Corden's performance was offensive. So at least it's getting some kind of buzz. Um, I like musicals, so I'm probably going to enjoy watching it at least. And I've seen Streep in a couple of musicals, and she's actually really good at musicals and stuff like that. So, you know, I don't expect a whole lot of substance to this because, honestly, a lot of Ryan Murphy projects don't have a whole lot of substance to them. There are a lot of flashy and colors and stuff like that, but I'm going to give it a try. It's on Netflix. That's a nice uh, little tag onto anything. Well, at least it's on Netflix. <laughs> yeah. so you can watch it, watch it anytime you want. So this last one for the week of the 11th is Wild Mountain Time. And this is an Irish ro romantic comedy starring Emily Blunt and uh, Jamie Dornan, who play two young people who live on neighboring farms. And there's a... A lot of ten maybe some sexual tension between the two of them for most of their lives, and they're both really weird and quirky, and a lot of the people in this small Irish town talk about them, but there's also a lot of land issues because Jamie Dornan's character's father, played by Christopher Walken, which I'm going to admit, I actually got to screen this this week, so I won't say much, but like the worst Irish accent I've ever heard from Christopher Walken is trying to sell his son's rightful land over to his American cousin, played by John Hamm. And so there's arguing over land, there's romance in it. It's Irish. What do you think, Alex? Well, you know, it's funny. Christopher Walken being attached to things over the years, you you get you're like uh oh you know because he's he's done a lot of like not so great stuff, um, <laughs> you know, kind of like bordering on being like Nicolas Cage, sort of. <gasps> yeah. So, but he did he did a movie with you know I saw over a month ago with Al Pacino. It's, it's, it came out many years ago now, but I think it was called Knock Off Guys. If I'm stand up guys. Stand up stand up guys. Yes. Yeah, it was actually really sweet. It was a really sweet movie, and it was funny, and it was Alan Arkin was in it. So I'll, I'll, I'll green like that only because I actually like John Hamm. I think when Christopher Walken is good, he's great. And, um, you know, I have a soft spot for the, the romance comedies. You know, I like the, I like the holiday. Okay. No. <laughs> if we got a yes from Alex here, what about you, Matt? Uh, I don't know. None of these movies are, like, grabbing me today. I don't know. Matt just doesn't like movies. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the hateful SOB. Like, <laughs> um, I'll admit, now, they're not, all three of them are like, oh, okay, that's not really my thing. But, you know, I know that some, sometimes, ro like, romance, romance comedy, but sometimes that stuff surprises me. Like, some mm -hmm. of the old, like, Tom Cruise, Nicole Kidman stuff where you'd be like, oh, what's this? But then like, oh, this is freaking sexy. Like, you know, like, so you'd like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it gets, so. so I, well, actually, I guess technically I could talk about this because this won't come out until Wednesday when the embargo's up for this movie. But I liked it. I think it was a fun time. It was a beautiful film. It's written and directed by the writer of Moonstruck and the writer and director of Doubt, which oh, wow. to say that they're the same person is kind of weird because I didn't realize like the writer and director of Doubt also wrote Moonstruck of all things. So, but like Emily Blunt's really charismatic and Christopher Walken's accent is horrendous, but... It's probably the best work he's done since Seven Psychopaths, at least for me. 
I think he did a really good job and like he showed sold the emotion. It's it's just weird enough to make it I want to watch it because it's that weird. Like it doesn't come off as just like your stereotypical rom-com because it's a little weird and quirky about it. Cuz like the two main characters are just the two weirdest people in the town and you're like, well, they should be together, right? So it kind of has that feel, but if you're not, if like rom-coms are definitely not your thing, I don't think this movie is going to like change your mind. But at least if you're open to being surprised by one, I think this one might. But so then we have a couple of films coming out the following weekend. So the first one is Fatal. And this is a new film from the director of such films as the most recent traffic film with a K because it was about like human trafficking um also crap what the hell was that movie called with Dennis Quaid who plays this like crazy psycho former owner of a house and a black couple moves in and the intruder the intruder yes so this is the same director as that and it's starring Hillary Swank as a cop who's kind of yeah Hillary Swank she's back So she kind of gets this man caught up in this kind of investigation. It's supposed to be like a sultry kind of thriller, like a lot of this director's films. But Alex, is that enough to sell you on Fatal? I'm going to give it a... um... I'm going to give it a yellow, that yellow light only because I, I want to like believe in Hillary Swank, you know, she hasn't done anything big in a, in a while, you know, she used to be huge. Um, I never saw the intruder that didn't appeal to me. So yeah. Yeah. Oh, it wasn't very good. Oh, oh, oh kind of in the middle. So yeah, I, I'm going to have to give this one a yellow light leaning toward uh, development hell. Quick note about The Intruder, if it wasn't for how over-the-top Dennis Quaid and crazy he was in that movie, I would have absolutely hated it. Would have given it, like, an F. But, like, his just (laughs) insanity made it at least a little bit entertaining for me. But those are my thoughts. Matt, what do you think of Fatal? (laughs) Out of all the movies that you listed so far, that's the one that I want to see the most slash. I'd be interested to watch the trailer to get a better understanding of what it's about. Um, yeah, maybe. Yeah, why not? Why not? I, I might not watch. Maybe I'll wait for you to say good or bad. <laughs> then I still might not watch it, but I don't know. Um, <laughs> I might be getting a screener for it, so I probably will be watching it early it's crazy, next man, week, but you know, it's one of those things where, like, if you have the right people involved, especially if it's like a cop oriented drama or a cop oriented thing, um, and it's the right director with the right screenwriter at the right point in their career where they, they need a hit, they gotta get you know something good out there, it could be really great. Like, um, there's that movie with Jake Gyllenhaal called, um, out, uh, um out of watch or end of end watch. of watch it's a really good movie mm-hmm. uh, you know about these two cops in uh, i think it's i think south central um and it's just like whoa the other films from that filmmaker are not uh, at the same quality uh, what do you mean you don't love suicide squad <laughs> I, I i watched that on, on a plane without audio and i was like yeah i don't need to see this movie like i could just tell but um but yeah no so it's one of those things like if this director's like man i need to freaking get my stuff together and put out a damn good movie it could be really good but that sort of storyline with it with an actor who's is you know definitely you know in danger of being washed up it could be it could be a, it could be a wreck I don't have a lot of hope for this movie. Like, I thought it looked interesting until I looked up who directed it. Because, like, I've seen a handful of his movies and have never once actually liked them. So I'm like, "Ah." because Hilary Swank was just on a Netflix series called uh, Away, which was like a space 
about like astronauts going up to Mars and she was great in it. She's a great actress. The, the, the show was a little derivative. I felt like it didn't do a whole lot different for like space travel movies and stuff like that. And the show also just got canceled after one season. So by Netflix, because a lot of shows are getting canceled right now during all of this, but like, yeah. I'm rooting for Hillary Swank because, like, she was so popular and, like, on top of the world. And then poof, it's like, and then he was gone. <laughs> that That's <laughs> Hillary Swank's <laughs> career <Right>. right now. <laughs> the, exactly. it's, it's rough, man. It's a, it's a, those, those are some sharp teeth in those, uh, yeah. Jaws. Now, this next movie. Seems like it could be fun. So this is Greenland, which is a disaster movie about a natural disaster starring Gerard Butler. Also directed by the director <laughs> director of the most recent Angel Has Fallen film. So I, Matt already gave his answer. Those were some strong thumbs down in the bottom frame there. I Alex, like, what I saw the trailer already and I was not a fan, so no, this is not for me. Hi. Have a good night, guys. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think... Okay, well, Greenland's not getting made. That was a quick and easy one. So this is... Now, this is probably the most interesting of the ones coming out that we're going to talk about, and that's Ma Rainey's... Oh, crap. Ma Rainey's... I keep Black Bottom. And this is the new Netflix film starring Viola Davis and Chadwick Boseman's last film about a jazz group during sessions of trying to record music. And it's like an hour and a half, just tense film about the creative musical process. And like, this is getting some serious buzz and like pretty sure Chadwick Boseman's already getting posthumous awards for this film yeah. for best supporting actor. So Alex, what are your thoughts? Absolutely, that's, not, that's right up my alley. Yeah, totally. What's it? What's I'm sorry. What's the title again? Ma Rainey's Black Bottom. Ma this comes out. This is a Netflix original too, so this will come out on the 18th, I think. I also forgot to mention Greenland is now an Amazon Prime original, so that also comes out on Amazon Prime on the 18th. So you could just stream it, but like, so this is another <laughs> Netflix film coming out. They have some big ones coming out in December. What about you, Matt? Yeah, no, I like that. I feel like I feel like that is required viewing. Like if you like music and movies, or and that definitely if you're a fan of like Chadwick, yeah, then like like people are going to watch that. People and I think should. people are going to cry, honestly, and, because and which is which is good. That's like an awesome movie then to like you know to kind of like end on. So unfortunately. Th those are the movies we are going to talk about this week. I know there's one other big Netflix one coming out the following week with George Clooney in it, that Midnight Sky, but we'll talk about that next time. Does anybody else feel like they know Clooney? Like, I feel like I know him. I feel like he I'm seems, he seems <laughs> like he's friends with all of us, right? <laughs> <laughs> That's why he's famous. That's why he's very sad. <laughs> I, and you know what's crazy is he hasn't been in a film since Money Monster in 2016, I think that was, 2015, 2016. So I'm excited to see him back in front of the camera because he did do Suburbicon as a director, which that one was a bit of a mess. Actor turning director, man, it's tough. Like, he's shown that he can direct – but this was a this was a screenplay that the Coens abandoned because they're like we couldn't make this work. Sure. sure. If the Cohen brothers tell you they can't make their script work, what <laughs> makes you think you can? <laughs> so honestly, that was my thoughts, and I'm like, because eh. like I remember the trailer; it looked like a Cohen brothers movie. I'm like, and like obviously George Clooney's worked with them plenty of times too, and. He's done some of his best work, I think. And, like, he he is amazing in Oh Brother, Where Art Thou? That's some of the most charismatic I've seen George Clooney in such a slimy, just 
con artist, but he's hilarious and so great. But anyway, so those are some of the movies that are going to be coming out soon. So we're going to start off with our main topic of the week then, which is our top three animated films. Now, when we started, th- when I, when Matt had originally brought this topic up, the first thing that started popping in my head was I have to start thinking about my favorite films of different studios because I feel like animation is definitely like a studio driven genre because you have Pixar, you have Disney animation and they've been for years kind of rolling over animation, but you have DreamWorks, you have WAG now Warner's animation group you have Studio Ghibli, which has made some of the most amazing fantasy films of all time. And some of my personal favorites, like Laika, which is still making stop motion animation, which I was so close to putting one of their films in my top three. So close. And honestly, my personal favorite's called Cartoon Saloon. And it's a small Irish one that does all still hand-drawn 2D animation, and they have some great films. But not to jump too deep into it right now, but does anybody have any honorable mentions they want to throw out before we jump into talking about our top three? Alex, you want to go? No, no, you first, you first. I, I, I have a cheat. It's an honorable mention, but I'm, I'm cheating. So I'll let you... I'll okay. let you. <laughs> <laughs> Um, it's okay. I cheated too on my top three, so yeah, that's no problem. Um, let me see. So on. My... Go I, don't, I don't think I cheated, so I guess I'm <laughs> the only honorable one here. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead, Matt. Um, I would say I have three Rugrats in Paris because that movie's fantastic, and even even though it's meant for little kids, eh, little, yeah. It, um, I remember it being really awesome because I had never seen a movie like where the plot was so focused on uh, like a little boy's having to deal with the fact that his mother passed away and kind of like, uh, I don't know. I just thought that was like really like mature and interesting, but also you're watching everything through the lens <clears throat> of like a kid so I don't know. I think they, it's a really delicate subject matter. I think they did an awesome job. And also I remember liking Rugrats when that movie came out. Well, so Rugrats, Rugrats was a decently mature show when you have moments like uh, Mr. Pickles making pudding, what, at like two o'clock in the morning. And it's just like, Stu, what are you doing? It's just like, I think all of us have had those moments where you're just so fried <laughs> that you're just like, what am I even doing? <laughs> I call those Mondays. <laughs> um, the Simpsons movie is my number is another one runners up. Uh, I had so I've been watching The Simpsons since like when they would come on after school, after I would get out of middle school, and I would like make sure that my VHS was recording it. It'd be like, awesome, like fast forward through commercials, like just watch it every single day just make sure that like i didn't record over another episode because the dvds weren't out yet i don't it, i've been watching it for a long time but i love i love the simpsons and when that movie came out what, i think 2007 or something like that when we were still in 2007 school. 2008 somewhere around there yeah yeah, yeah like that which is funny because that's also around where juno came out too um and i'll get to that in a second but uh like later on but yeah the simpsons movie really awesome recommend it uh and then I think it was on Netflix, and I think it just got pushed to Hulu. There's this um, animated claymation movie called My Life as a Zucchini. Oh, I have sure? that. You have that? Oh, yeah. Okay, so uh, it's a really, really short. It's, I made sure I, like, bought it. It's like, <laughs> so it's like I think it's like an movie. hour and 10, hour and 15 minutes or something like that. Yeah, definitely, like, you could digest that, like, super quick. Um, it's a really, it's a really awesome movie. It's it's probably uncomfortable for, it can be uncomfortable probably for a lot of people because a lot of what the movie's talking about is like orphans and like the trauma that have put each one of the main characters in this place together and how some adults, you can't really trust them because they're like 
they're like incredibly bad, but I don't know, there's like a lot of cool stuff that the movie does. I wouldn't necessarily say it's for kids, so I wouldn't recommend that, but um, I don't know, it's pretty dope. I like that movie a lot. So <laughs> I have a fun anecdote specifically about that movie because like I mentioned, I own it. I had it on my Amazon wish list a couple of Christmases ago. And my stepmom gave me the weirdest look. And she's like, my life is a zucchini. And like, my first thought is like, you don't get it. It's French. Because <laughs> it's a French animated film, like originally. So like, this isn't like your little kids, like American animation movie. Like, it has some emotional heft to it. I'm like... Just because the kid's name Zucchini doesn't mean this is just some stupid, silly movie. So Definitely not. But, but. And the cast is... Oh, so the, the reason I bought a Juno was because of uh, Elliot Page like and, and like that thing. And I thought that was really interesting because like the day that that... Like it's like when he came out and like said everything, like it was so quick that I guess Google immediately changed like anytime like if you like type in like ellen like it'll switch it to elliot like immediately like when you like finally hit the search it's so interesting i thought that was really cool i like the fact that like there wasn't there's not like a weird tug of war in that way i was like oh damn that's like respect who, who I don't is know, that I that's cool. elliot page so elliot page oh. came out as trans who so i know there's been I read a whole entire article on Yahoo about uh, dead naming. So, because some people mentioned Elliot Page's former name. So, like, it's, it's uh, Elliot Page came out publicly on, I think it was Twitter this yeah. week about okay. coming out as a trans man. Elliot, Elliot Page was Ellen Page? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. All right. Oh, my bad. <laughs> so. Yeah. And he is in uh, My Life as a Zucchini. I forget what character, but yeah. Yeah, it's actually a really good cast. If you, like, look up, like, the... Yeah, Nick Offerman's in it. I'm yeah. like, Ron Swanson. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah. Alex, what was your honorable mention? Well, the, the only one I have, and it's not a movie. I'm just going to, any chance I get a chance, anytime I get a chance to talk about the X-Men animated series, I'm going to. Yes. Yeah. That's, right. That's all that needs to be said, man. Come on. You know, those vo that voice acting, that music, that was the shit. Not a movie. <laughs> oh, the, the intro. Oh, that, that 90s guitar is just like that. And the 90s Spider-Man. I used to watch those two every mm -hmm. morning before school. And it's like Spider-Man and like like the talk <laughs> box and everything. I'm just like, ah. Oh. Brings back so many great memories. Like I watched so many animated shows as a kid. And those are like by far my two favorite animated comic book shows. Like, was, yeah, I was in first grade and I was like, holy moly. You know, he just... Wolverine just punched Cyclops in the stomach as hard as he could. This is awesome. <laughs> <laughs> but um, my some of my honorable mentions, uh, this one was really hard not to put on there because I absolutely love A Nightmare Before Christmas. And, like, mm -hmm. I love stop-motion animation. It's so incredible. And I just watched um, the new episodes of the movies that make us – on Netflix and they had an episode about making Nightmare Before Christmas and like the music, like the whole design and everything, just love it. I watch it every single Halloween and it works for Christmas. Um, I forgot the movies that make us. I forgot you recommended that. I yeah, they came out with two new episodes, the holiday movies that make us and it's Elf and um, Nightmare Before Christmas. Yeah. Um, Kubo and the Two String, this was probably the hardest one not to put in my top three because this was one of my favorite films of 2016 when it came out. I love Kubo and Laika is so impressive and the voice cast is amazing from Charlize Theron and uh, Matthew McConaughey is, he seems like such an odd choice to be in that movie, but
but the character he plays works so well. And the animation's amazing. The action's amazing. The fantasy elements are so cool. Rooney Mara playing the two, like, creepy sisters in it are absolutely haunting. Just, like, listening to her voice and their design is so creepy. It works on so many levels. And, like, the music in it is amazing. And uh, I think it's Rita Spector does a cover of While My Guitar my guitar gently weeps for the film and it's beautiful Absolutely. so and i have to give a shout out to um cartoon saloon because i didn't put either song of the sea or wolf walkers that actually came out in 2020 presently my number one film of 2020 and they're beautiful beautiful fantasy films that don't shy away from getting deep and meaningful the music is always great. It's like breathtaking to just look at the animation. But this was a hard list for me to make. Honestly, some of these are definitely on there because I've loved them for so long and they just have such a deep-seated place in my love of film. So, but now to the actual list. So, Alex, what's your number three? My number three. So this was this was kind of a tough list for me to make because I don't watch a lot of animated movies. but. The truth is, when I do sit down to watch them, I always appreciate them. And I remember really, really liking it. I think I saw this one in the theater, uh, Inside Out, um, five years ago. That was, that, was just a, that was just a real tearjerker. And it was very clever and it was really well done. And, you know, I've, I've had different jobs and a career working with people and, you know, talking with people in social, psychological way. And so you can't help but, you know, be attracted to that. I think, you know, it, it, was, it, was, just, it was just very, very clever and uh, very, very sweet. So I think that that's, that's my number three is Inside Out. I have a couple of thoughts. One, whoever cast Lewis Black as anger was <laughs> so inspired. Yeah. Two, Bing Bong, all I'm going to say. And three, I don't think anybody laughed as hard in the theater when they were in Cloud Town and the one cloud cop turns to the other one's like, Jake, it's okay. It's Cloud Town. I'm like, you got a Chinatown <laughs> reference in this movie. Because <laughs> like there's a bunch of like teenage girls in the theater with us and I'm like, none of them have seen Chinatown and I'm the only one sitting there being like, I got that reference. Right. <laughs> you old man. <laughs> oh, but Inside Out was that, like, yeah. for a while, Pixar was doing so many sequels and, like, not on the same level of what you expect from Pixar. And, like, Inside Out came out and was just like, holy shit. It really got me. And, like, I feel like Soul's a bit of, like, a spiritual successor to this in some ways. And I'm really looking forward to seeing that because it's... I feel like it's kind of dealing with some of the same ideas at least, but like Inside Out's great. I love it. Any I like Inside Out because it was, I remember watching the movie and then as it got like closer and closer towards the end, can we spoil? Can we talk about endings like in this, view, in this, in this movie? Well, yeah, I yeah, feel we... like memes have <laughs> ruined at least one of them. <laughs> uh, so uh, towards the end of the Inside Out, when, eh, this is kind of big actually. When you find out that the sadness, like the emotion or the personification of sadness is like, she's getting pushed away. So then the main character can feel everything else but sadness. Then that kind of like screws everything up. So then like the message, one of the messages I guess is like being sad is okay. I think that was dope as hell. I think that's really important. I mean, because it is true, like, it's okay to be sad. It's okay to feel all those feelings. Like, I, I, and at the very end, when she meets the boy, and then you find out how other people's, like, emotions interact, or, like, or freak out, and then the cat has emotions, and, like, they, that was also hilarious. They're all laying yeah. around, just, like, hitting. <laughs> that, that was one of the most inspired gags in an animated movie, is when you see everybody <laughs> else. It's, like, some people, they're all anger. Mm -hmm. and, but um, 
I think that film is so clever for little kids to see to really help process emotions. And like definitely what you said, Matt, how important all of our emotions are in feeling them. That was a great pick, Alex. Yeah, thank you, thank you. Well said too, very well said there. How about you make us cry on the first on the first pick, Alex? (laughs) 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 We should end the video now. (laughs) Goodbye. I was ready to leave after Greenland. (laughs) (laughs) Matt, what's your number three? Um, I mean, this is where I cheated. So I couldn't, I couldn't like pick a three out of these three. So I went Iron Giant, Incredibles, and screwed it away. Um, Iron Giant. I remember watching that movie. I see how you cheated now. (laughs) (laughs) This is a top five list for Matt. Exactly. Um, but I can't, I feel like they're all in the same, I can't pick one over the other two for some reason. Iron Giant is awesome. Brad Bird. Uh, there's like a lot of interesting stuff in there. The whole movie is about like, you can choose who you want to be. And Ben Diesel is in it. And like, I don't know, it's just a fantastic movie. Sad as hell, Eddie. But like, yeah, you remember, right? Like, Ben Diesel. Like, oh, man. It's like, oh, crap. Like, but I finally checked out the Vin Diesel song that you sent me. <laughs> oh, yeah, you listened to it? <laughs> Terrible, right? It's terrible. Yeah, it's uh, but it's got... It, 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 it's got some likes. He's got some followers. Oh. Of course it does. <laughs> um, Incredibles, because the movie's awesome. I, I, I can't think of another movie on this list where I've seen it. Saw it when it came out in theaters. And then I saw it a few other times because, you know, it's awesome. Slash probably like was on it in school because schools love, you know, killing time. Um, and then as I've seen it recently, I saw it in college maybe like twice, just got bored. And then I saw it recently, maybe a couple of years ago, that movie works on so many levels where it's like, you understand certain things. Like little kid of me definitely didn't understand that like, oh, so that was like marital discord inside of my action movie. What the hell? But yeah, so dope as hell movie. And uh, actually again, Brad Bird too. I, I wasn't even on Syndrome. Yeah, like, and it's pretty like, yeah, You awesome. caught me monologuing. You caught me monologuing. <laughs> and got busy. <laughs> oh, and Spirit Away is awesome. That was the first ever Studio Ghibli movie that I saw. And I was like, damn, okay, anime. Yes, show me more of this. <laughs> yeah, Spirit I mean, Away is probably one of the greatest fantasy films made, just period. And... Like I'm, if I'm not mistaken, it won the second ever animation Oscar for 2002 mm-hmm. when it came out. I'm actually going to be talking about the first winner, but we'll talk about that later. Um, but like, definitely, Studio Ghibli helped me get into anime, not counting Pokemon and Yu-Gi-Oh, because obviously that was like the first anime that I watched as a kid. Where they cheat. Can't even watch those shows and be like, you don't follow the rules of this game. <laughs> but that's a whole side thing. But so, <laughs> Matt, thank you for cheating <laughs> and including the whole <laughs> of those. You know, you could have talked about the two of them in your uh, honorable mentions. <laughs> Less funny. <laughs> <laughs> so, my number three is my favorite Pixar film. And this has been my favorite since I was a kid, and it's Monsters, Inc. And Mm -hmm. I love the concept. I love the idea of, like, monsters trying to, like, keep their world alive and running on screams. And, like, the casting of Billy Crystal in that movie is so inspired because Mike Wazowski is hilarious. He just embodies that manic energy of Billy Crystal and then John Goodman is one of my favorite character actors of all time and he's just so lovable as Sully and like Steve Buscemi as Randall is so creepy and menacing and James Coburn in one of his last films voicing Mr. Water News he can be terrifying and that design of him being like a creepy crab and like him chasing them through the hallways and like running on the walls and stuff. I'm like, 
as a kid, I was probably terrified of that. And Boo is so cute. Just such an ador- adorable little kid. And that hits me in the feels every time the end of that movie when they put the door together. And just the look on Sully's face when he walks through the door and sees Boo and she's like, kitty! And I'm like... <laughs> Single tier, but I love Monster Inc. Never saw that one. I, know it's a really I would recommend it. <laughs> um, I remember Monsters Inc. That was an awesome movie. Uh, I remember two things, but I've only seen it maybe like twice, so I only remember two things. One, I remember the fact that after I saw the movie, someone pissed me off in school, so I called him a Cretan. And that's a word <laughs> in Monsters Inc. <laughs> and then the second thing is that after you what? drink a cup of tea, like right after you, you call yeah, exactly. you're such a cretin. <laughs> and I punch him in the face. I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> no, you bit them like a dinosaur, right, Matt? Exactly. You should share that story one day. Um, and then the second thing I remember with Monsters Inc. is that I had a PS2, but then I. So it was a gift that someone gave me because the game came out for that movie, but didn't give me a memory card. So I had to like, like playing the game. You know, like when you turn it off, you got to start from the beginning. I had to do that like four times until I had to, until I got a memory. Damn it, stupid. <laughs> All those video games that didn't used to have memory cards or like <laughs> hard drives now because just all the systems have hard drives in them. But... <laughs> Alex, what's your number two? <laughs> uh, my number two. My number two is The Lion King, you know, because um, I was thinking back to all the, you know, movies we would watch in school, Disney movies, and that Lion King has always held up really well. Um, you know, James Earl Jones' voice is amazing. Uh, Jeremy Irons is great casting as, uh, as Scar there. And um, yeah, no, it's just that the music is great. You know, for somebody who's usually not into musicals, you know, the music is just is just really good. Um, I got to, I was I was lucky to see the Broadway play when I was young too, which is pretty. It was you know you remember it like you know the story and everything, but you just the spectacle they put on is just was just really cool. And um, yeah, so so you gotta gotta go with the Lion King there. So, I. I love musicals and I love music and movies and be prepared is one of my favorite songs from like animated movies. I just, and like the whole, that whole aesthetic with like Jeremy Irons is so like his scar is so like he has like, obviously Jeremy Irons has like a classiness to him, but so underhanded and like the whole entire like Nazi imagery during that scene in the movie, I'm like, there's goose stepping hyenas here. This is uh, this is going some places, <laughs> but um, and and like Elton John wrote a lot of the music to this movie, so it's like it's in good hands. And I remember watching. Um, I used to have one of his concerts on DVD, the Red Piano Tour. So like he was playing in Vegas. And the two, my two favorite quotes from that show, one has to do with the Lion King. And he's like, you know, when I won my first Oscar, it's like, I never would have thought that in a million years, I would write a song that had, when I was a young warthog. (laughs) (laughs) So like him being able to understand like, this sounds so stupid, but you know, it works. And the other thing in it was, because he was playing in the place that Celine Dion usually plays in in Vegas. And he is so sassy. And he was just like, you see, oh, she looks great. I hate that bitch. You know, if she had to sit behind this giant piano for 30 years, she'd look like Mama Cass. <laughs> and I'm just like... <laughs> That got me so bad. Matt and I tried to get tickets for his last tour, but like by the time we got around to them, they were like four hundred dollars a ticket. I'm like, ugh. Uh, well, Elton John could do that. Over my budget, so. Yeah. Um. <laughs> anyway, 
just some thoughts on uh, Elton John and his Lion King music. Matt, what is your number two? My number two, uh, I'll go Akira. Akira is, uh, that movie is pretty awesome. If you've seen either the movie Chronicle or if you've seen the music video for the for Kanye West's uh, Stronger or Harder Better, yeah, yeah, Stronger. Um, like you've seen like little grabs from this movie that came out in like I think 88 or something like that. It was fantastic. It's about this boy who, I mean, he's not really asking for it, but like he unfortunately ends up with superpowers, but, and this is like a very adult movie, but um, he ends up with superpowers and then he like starts to lose control of these powers. And it's like hard to explain what the powers are without spoiling some stuff, but like, it's so interesting and it's so heady and it's, there's like alternate dimensions and there's like political stuff going on in there. And there's like a lot of death, like sadly, but it is animated to hell. It is so awesome to look. It's like, like, wow. Like, it, people actually move and it looks, I guess maybe because like the amount of frames that they must have drawn or whatever per second. I don't know what the hell, but like, it's an awesome movie. Great, great. Everyone, everyone should watch it. Everyone should watch it. <laughs> I saw a whole entire video just on um, animating lighting and the usage of light in it is breathtaking and stuff like Akira and like Ghost in the Shell, the action in those anim in the anime is so amazing. It's like it rivals some live action action movie classics that it's so intense and suspenseful. It's a that movie will punch you in the gut like hard it's really impactful so i would definitely recommend it if you haven't seen akira i ha i haven't i know i know that was on your top 10 uh, i think it was on your top 10 correct me if I'm wrong. yeah i think so yeah yeah i definitely uh i gotta yeah that's been one i need to see i know um for there was for a while rumors that christopher nolan was going to do a live action akira film and a lot of people had a lot of feelings about it, especially after Ghost in the Shell got made mm -hmm. and like really whitewashed things and stuff like that. And then um, Taika Waititi was announced to actually do one. And then I think Disney kind of like grabbed his soul. Like, you're ours now. <laughs> and has like Thor Love and Thunder. He has a Star Wars project. So I don't know if Warner Brothers Akira movie with... Taiko TT making it's going to happen anytime soon. So, but so my number two is same era as Lion King of that like Disney animation ah. renaissance is Beauty and the Beast. And I love Beauty and the Beast. And growing up as a kid, like <laughs> apparently my brother and myself watched that so many times that my brother just ran around the house being like, it's a girl. Like, because, <laughs> I'm just like, you know, like, I, I have yet to have children, but knowing that children will watch the same exact thing over and over and over and over again. So I'm glad I didn't have a kid when Frozen and Moana came out <laughs> because you'd be hearing them all the time. But like, I watched that film so many times and I love the music so much. Like, Be Our Guest is so fantastic. Beauty and the Beast is such a beautiful song. And I love Angela Lansbury. And she, her as Mrs. Potts was so fantastic. The voice cast was so great. Like, Jerry Orbach, which was a very odd choice to be playing, like, a like a French candles, candelabra, like, candlestick. But, like... His French accent is really obnoxious, but it's fun. <laughs> and uh, like just everything about it. And I'm sorry, my printer decided to phantom come on. And now all I can hear is my printer going off. Thought, um, but I thought, I thought someone was making a smoothie. <laughs> so maybe it'll eventually shut up. I should probably just unplug it, but somehow it's still probably come on and 
make noises while I'm trying. Is it like testing something or is it really printing out something? No, it's not actually printing out anything. Uh, oh, so that means it's haunted. You yes. Go, you need to go off. Of <laughs> exactly. Um, but Beauty and the Beast, like, it's so iconic and Belle's my favorite Disney princess. Like she was the smart girl who liked to read. I'm like, I was a kid who loved to read and stuff like that. I'm like, it's my kind of Disney princess. And it always worked for me. And <laughs> I like that. <laughs> Alex is judging over here, silently judging, but like Shane, I, I, for, I liked uh, the, Female bunny from uh, Space Jam. Oh, so, I'm not, so I'm not gonna. I'm not going even laugh at you. Yep, yep. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> For like two seconds, it's not nothing crazy. Just two seconds. Oh. <laughs> the crush died when the credits rolled. Like, <laughs> you think Bugs Bunny ever, you know, dresses up, you know, like girl bunny, you know, just like, Wait, <laughs> girl bunny. <laughs> So back to my point, though, like I like the fact that Belle was intelligent and resourceful because like a lot of like a lot of like the classic, classic Disney princesses were just like, oh, I'm going to like fall asleep or somebody's going to poison me and somebody has to save me. And like the whole dynamic with the Beast, I love the Beast as a character. And like, obviously, he was a kind of an asshole. And then he had to learn a very hard lesson, which to be fair, the fact that if you do the math, this kid was like 10 years old when he got turned into a monster. I'm just like, it's a little mean, it's a little harsh, but I like the how they, there are certain things about the remake that I do like. Making him an adult when he got turned into a beast was probably one of my favorite because like, yeah. I could see a witch turning like a 20 something year old asshole prince into a giant beast, but like turning a 10 year old into a giant monster for the rest of his life seems a little harsh. Um, but anyway, so I just love Beauty and the Beast. I always like, I, I, I always liked Belle too, just for the record. I always liked her and uh, um, beautiful girl, wonderful girl I dated in, in, in um, California named Adrian. I always say, used to say she, she, she's a singer and she has like a Disney princess type of voice. Mm -hmm. and she teaches classes and she teaches a lot of kids and she, she did a lot of theater. So she has that bell type of, of voice. So, mm -hmm. so yeah. So I, can I, I like the bunny for the personality too, guys, just so you know. <laughs> 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 just we're all on the same page. How <laughs> weird. I just want to put a disclaimer here. I was putting that I liked her as a character and not that I was attracted to her. <laughs> but obviously, these two wanted to take that in a completely different way. And Matt, I do appreciate the joke that you made, though. <laughs> um, Alex, what's your number one? Um, my number one, um, what is my, oh, um, switching gears completely here. Uh, from from rabbits to to uh, to dinosaurs, my favorite, my number one, <laughs> has to be uh, it's got to be land the first land before time. Um, that's my that's my number one because I think I when I was a little kid, I think I was in nursery school or kindergarten. I used to watch it like every day, um, and you know i remember the, the animation of the first one at least i remember the sequels were like a little more like they were brighter it was a lot mm -hmm. more brighter colors but the first one it, it would almost kind of remind you of like the, the somewhat like the that batman animated series almost like they they paint they they drew it on like a black background or, or, or a dark background and because there was just such a depth to the color um and uh, yeah, the, the the characters were really um, cheerful and colorful. You had you know you had Ducky and uh, uh, you had Spike. You know you had Petrie. You know the little uh, the pterodactyl. So they they were cute, but it was also really tragic. I mean, um, going back to you know uh, Matt, you were talking about uh, the one where the the boy's mom dies um, early on. Um, that's just not like his his mom. Like a lot oh, of those fuck. Disney, a lot of those early 
childhood they, movies, like a parent dies in the first 15 minutes, and it's like, it's they, I, used to, I used to cry my eyes out. You they know, bambied like, it. They, they, yeah, they bambied it for sure. <laughs> and so, you know, yeah, yeah, it's just really sad. Um, but then you, like, he has to grow up as soon as that happens because his, I don't even know if his dad, his dad's not, his dad's not there, you know, or I don't know, I don't remember what goes on with the, 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 the little, uh, little foot's, little foot's father, but then they, they have to grow up and they have to find the Great Valley. So the, the death of his, his mom makes him go on this journey, you know, and it's just, uh, yeah. I think I had the first five or so on like VHS as a kid. And like, that was a very interesting time for animation. Cause like you had Land Before Time and you had stuff like Secrets of Nim. That was dark. If either of you have seen that, like. Is that the, like the puppets? No, um, that's a. Dark Crystal. Dark, dark Crystal. Crystal too. Um, but. The with, the, with the mouse? The, yes, Secrets of Nim is about like the mouse and like the rats and stuff like that. And it's violent. <clears throat> dark it's just like animation was on a whole different level in the 80s if you weren't in disney you were like we're gonna get a little dark here and not that like disney didn't get dark either but like not like secret of nims dark but like late before time i watched that all the time as a kid too all right matt what's your number one my number one uh Oh, I almost forgot, dude, when you said uh, uh, Beauty and the Beast, I immediately, uh, immediately made me think about, there's like this joke, because like earlier on in The Simpsons, in The Simpsons, they used to have like a lot of, I guess, like musical sequences, but then it kind of stopped as like things, the seasons went on. But if you type in, so like anybody that's watching this video, like listen or watch the, the section of the, I guess like that the movie, uh, Be Our Guest, and then type in the simpsons buy my vest and it's all about like <laughs> mr burns <laughs> wanting to like <laughs> take all the cute animals like around springfield and then like turn them into like a uh, like his fur coats and stuff like that it's like, <laughs> it's, but it's like I, like the lyrics and everything is like the same as the movie. i don't know i just think it's really funny uh my number one is grave of the fireflies that's another 80s anime Movie. Oh my! That movie. Uh, so it's my number one because it's a war movie. So it's definitely I would definitely wouldn't recommend it for kids. There's a lot of stuff that I don't like. Either kids wouldn't be interested in because it's it's about World War Two, but it's from but it's a Japanese movie talking about how like the people like like literal like under like the most underdog possible like civilian people just regular citizens were affected by like fire bombings and like radiation stuff and then so like the political stuff that wouldn't be interesting probably for kids and then like the stuff that wouldn't be like appropriate for kids would be like the amount of violence and like anger and that's another movie that it's kind of interesting a lot of children's movies like well, a lot of animated movies i guess or whatever they say like uh like don't trust adults. I don't know. I've always thought that was interesting when you have like kid protagonists. But there's like a lot of a lot of that. A lot of people that just start like effed up. Uh, but you just you watch this little this little boy. He's like, like a teenager, like 14 something like that, and his five year old little sister, and they're kind of having to just survive and kind of like live. And they, I will spoil a little bit of it they um like they're not gonna make it and you can tell and i'm only gonna say that because you you know what's gonna happen at the end by the very beginning of the movie but then the whole rest of the movie is kind of like how did you get to that point and it's it's really hard to watch i definitely wouldn't recommend it because it's like there's not like many cheerful scenes but it's it's really awesome it's really awesome grave of the fireflies recommend it it, it's one of those kinds of movies that it's just like there's certain films that's like oh this makes sense this is an animated movie like this is just like a straight drama film just animated and horrifying and just it 
is heavy. So don't don't go into watching this movie expecting like a light, fun animated adventure because this is not that at all. Yeah, that's, that's like when I saw Pan's Labyrinth and I was like, oh, like weird creatures. That must be for kids. And then like, so this Fascism. is a while back. Yeah, and then like the DVD like from Netflix came in to like, you know, like my mailbox. And I was like, why is this rated R? Maybe it's a typo. And you <laughs> no. watch it, it's like, oh, it, it's not a typo. <laughs> Peter Pan's Labyrinth? <laughs> no, not Peter Pan's Labyrinth. <laughs> so now that Matt's brought us down quite a few notches, we can reverse that right away because so I made a, a I alluded to my number one by mentioning this was the first ever film to win the How best. You're making me laugh. I, I just we well, yeah, I, I know. I'm I'm sorry, I'm sorry, Shannon. I need to be at a diner so I can I can release my Jersey sarcasm like full force at some point. Please, give me that vaccine. Please, God. <laughs> so, sorry, the first ever Best Animated Feature Oscar winner was Shrek in 2001. And Shrek, and oh. like, it's... I always flip flop back and forth between Shrek and Shrek 2, but like Shrek is one of those movies like I'm pretty sure I could quote the movie from start to finish. And I've watched that movie so many times and I remember seeing that as a kid when I was 10 years old in theaters and the look on my mom and my aunt's faces when Lord Farquaad's like, now tell me, where are the others? Like, eat me! And it's just like, my mom was like, they just say that in a kid's movie. Watching Shrek as an adult is so much better than watching it as a kid. Like, it's a lot of fun as a kid, but watching it as an adult is so much better. And the dick jokes, the phallic symbols, the the whole, like, the eat me thing with Gingy, and there's Lord Farquaad messing himself to a picture of Fiona at one point. I'm just like, Thanks. like <laughs> this movie, and yeah, like it's so, so dark and like dirty in those kinds of ways, but like it's such a great lampoon of like fairy tale films. And like, I love every moment, like the part where Shrek's just pulling out every famous pro wrestling move, beating the crap out of a bunch of knights to Joan Jett bad reputation you have like them traveling to like um i'm on my way and just all star the whole opening to smash mouth like smash mouth was a thing because of shrek probably mm -hmm. and like i'm a believer at the end and like the voice cast like mike myers is amazing with shrek and Eddie Murphy, God, I miss Eddie Murphy so much doing things. And, like, honestly, it's weird. The whole entire main cast of this film don't really do much anymore. Because, like, Mike Myers hasn't done any film, really, since Love Guru. Um, and technically, <laughs> Glorious Bastards. And, like, Cameron Diaz is retired from acting. And then Eddie Murphy disappeared and is finally coming back. But, and like John Lithgow as Lord Farquaad, which even, just think of his name. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, just all the fairy tale creatures, the gingerbread man's hilarious. I love Gingy. And like, even with like Shrek 2, I don't know how many scenes in movies make me laugh as hard as when they're flipping through the channels and they're like, tonight on nights, we're following a white Bronco through the woods. And I'm just like, <laughs> they just make an OJ joke and then they capture Donkey and he's screaming police brutality which hits in a whole other kind of way today <laughs> and then they grab Puss Puss in Boots and they find Catnip in his booth he's like that's not mine and like they're gonna totally bring him up on drug charges and they have literal pepper shakers pepper mm. spraying Shrek in the face. I'm just like, what is this movie? Let's see if I can make an observation. Do you guys know, for Shrek 2, because I know I saw, I saw Shrek a long time ago. I remember Shrek 2 more than the original Shrek. 
Mm -hmm. Family Guy had already been pretty popular on TV when Shrek 2 was released. Probably, because Shrek 2 came out in 2004. When did Family Guy start? Oh, really? Oh, okay. Oh, yeah. No, as I remember watching Family Guy in my music class in high school, because my music teacher was, Mr. Gatsik was the freaking man. I loved, <laughs> loved him. Best teacher I ever had. Um, but, uh, yeah. So, I remember thinking in the theater, like, this feels like, you know, one of the producers from that show had an influence on the pacing of the humor. There was a randomness mm -hmm. about the humor, which of course South Park poked fun at, you know. Because it's a manatee writing all the jokes. Right. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah, um, so I, I mean, so I, I just, I remember thinking like this feels like the Family Guy had a big influence on humor and, and the pacing of humor in a lot of different things. Whether it was that'd be interesting or, because the humor definitely shifted a bit in the second Shrek movie than the first one. Cause like the second one definitely leaned a lot more into like the pop culture references, like random nods and like them, like even like, I love the whole entire scene of them making the giant gingerbread man bongo, which totally is a blazing saddles reference. It has to be. And them like running through the town and like him smashing a, uh, I don't think it's called Starbucks in the movie. I'm trying to remember what pun they use, but he destroys a Starbucks and then they run across the street and there's another Starbucks. Like even just little things like <laughs> that. And that whole sequence is to um, Holding for a Hero by like performed by the fairy godmother which I'm like straight out of Footloose. And I'm just like, this movie, and like Antonio Banderas was such a great addition as Puss in Boots in the second one. And just, I love Shrek so much. And if I need something to make me laugh and just enjoy it, and just, I could quote along the whole entire way. I love those movies so much. Like every year I watch for my birthday, either Shrek or Shrek 2. I kind of like rotate, but like, it really left an impact on me because like those, those movies were because like it's so crazy to think that Chris Farley recorded the voice for the whole entire movie and then he died the first Shrek yep really and then they recast and it's funny because um if you ever watched like if you watch Wayne's World 2 and earlier in the film where they're doing Wayne's World and he's like, I am the leprechaun. And he's doing like that creepy impression. I'm just like, that's Shrek. It's, yeah. it's Shrek and it's Fat Bastard. And I'm just like, <laughs> Fat Bastard. And I'm like, <laughs> I, I miss Mike Myers so much because like that. We were lucky in the 90s to have like Jim Carrey and Mike Myers and Eddie Murphy and just they were next level kind of comedians okay. and yeah. like it makes me so mad that the third Shrek it felt like they zapped all of the fun and magic out of it because like the third Shrek movie just feels so lazy and overplayed them like where's all the cleverness that was in the first two? And then most people don't even know there was a fourth one, Shrek Forever After. And like, it's okay. I still like it better than the third one, but like, I'm like, I don't even watch those two because I'm like, I have the first two and we're going to keep it that way. And there's <laughs> rumors that they're going to reboot Shrek and remake it. I'm like, that's a bad idea. But they just do it because they made so much money. Shrek 2 was, for a while, top 20 highest grossing films of all time. Wow. Good. That made like $444 million domestically. Like Shrek was a thing in the early 2000s. And now I do, there's one honorable mention I completely forgot to bring up earlier. And it's, quotability why this popped in my head was a uh, fantastic mr fox mm -hmm. from wes anderson he, he's just a little different and, <laughs> like 
It's just like exactly where he's just like, I want to live better. <laughs> and he just like out of nowhere just starts devouring his food like he would be because he's an animal. And <laughs> Wes Anderson, for some reason, his sensibilities work so well in a stop motion movie. I'm just like, Fantastic Mr. Fox is so quirky and... I don't think there's a better Roald Dahl adaptation than his Fantastic Mr. Fox movie because I think he just hit like that channel that Roald Dahl was writing on. It's just like, yep, it's weird. It's slightly dark. And like the dude, the one guy literally doesn't eat food. He lives on a liquid alcoholic cider diet. And, like, they hire, like, assassins and try to sh shoot the fox to death. And, like, it gets dark. And just, like, we got, we missed the fox, but we got the tail. And he, like, wears the tail as a necktie. And, like, just all kinds of just, like, and George Clooney is such a charming bastard in that movie. And you know why everybody listens to him, even though he's a complete idiot. Because he's just so charming. And just, I forgot to bring that one up earlier, but if you haven't I seen it. I still listen to the ending song, you know, like when they're in the little yes. supermarket it, and like that, it's called uh, Let Her Dance. I really yeah. don't sing it, but Let Her Dance. Look that up too. Like when you do Music and Wes Anderson movies are always so great to look up. It's like you want a hipster playlist, just listen to music from Wes Anderson movies. But yeah, you you gave me that movie, Shane. That's I watched it because you you actually I think you gave it to me for my birthday. It's it's such a quirky, weird movie, and it's just so much fun though. But. I had a lot of fun talking about animation. It's very interesting, the range of films we talked about. Because, like, you have those, like, Disney Renaissance, early 90s animated movies. You have stuff like Shrek. And then you have Grave of the Fireflies, which will, like, put you on a downer for days. <laughs> and it's just, like, a dark movie. Yeah. You had a particularly dark list there, Matt. Some of, like... I don't know. I mean, I have Rugrats. Huh, that's right. Well, to be fair, that was an honorable mention. <laughs> like, your top two were Akira and Grave of the Fireflies. I, uh, yeah, I mean, like, all right, guys, it's Friday night. Let's watch uh, uh, Mindbenders. What the hell? <laughs> oh, I'd watch Akira any Friday night. I need to see, uh, I need to see Spirit Away. I'd like to see Shrek and Shrek 2 again. Um, and Grave of the Fireflies, just the title sounds really cool. So yeah, I, I have a, a whole Studio Ghibli set of movies. So, like, I've seen so many of their films. And Miyazaki was just ridiculously talented. And some next level, like, I, I was, when I was thinking about this list, I was trying to think what my favorite Studio Ghibli film was. And it was a really close between Spirited Away and Princess Mononoke. But I wound up going with Princess Mononoke. That's an intense movie. But, you know, a lot of things to chat about. Now, I don't know if we wanted to wrap things up like we had the past couple episodes where we had one thing that we've been watching lately that we wanted to share. Do either of you have anything in particular that you've watched lately that you want to share with people? I think Alex has one. I do. I do. Because I... I... I think it's a lot better than a lot of people said. I don't think it's a great movie, but Hillbilly Elegy, which we talked about in your comments to your review, mm -hmm. I think is a much better movie than people are giving it credit. It's got like a 25% on Rotten Tomatoes. That is not an F movie. It's not a D. I wouldn't even call it a C plus. I, I, it's, I think it's B minus at the worst. I think Glenn Close is amazing. I think Amy Adams. Amy Adams scared me a couple of times watching oh. that movie. Yeah. I, hey, I worked as a case manager on Skid Frickin' Row. She did a really good job. I mean, you can see, like, you see it. Like, it, it was a much, I, I, I agree, it's a little disjointed, but, uh, you know, I do not think it is an F movie. And if you look at Rotten, a lot of people make their decisions of what they're going to see when they look at a Rotten Tomato score, and it's just not right. 
it's just that's an injustice to the film and the filmmakers because it's a much better film than I think people are giving it credit for. I um I have to look back at Ron Howard's filmography to really make that judgment, but like I was seeing people like this is by far the worst thing Ron Howard has ever done, and I'm like it's a bold statement for someone <laughs> who's been making films since like the 80s at least or like i think i looked it up he started directing in the 70s i'm not like, high i'm not high on him i'm not high. i've seen some films that i was like uh eh, like you know but i actually this <laughs> ironically i think this is one of my favorites of his i my i think my favorite ron howard's probably parenthood i really love that film a lot and i think a lot of people shit on a solo a star wars story way too much sure. because like it was supposed to be different directors and he got brought on to like fix it and like ron howard is not a director you bring in to just be like do something dynamic and out there like he's a very pretty by the numbers workman like director and that's okay because like if you need somebody to come in and do this thing right ron howard does it right and it's like i I think people should at least watch it. It's on Netflix too. So like, what's it going to kill you? It's like you pay, you either pay for a Netflix account or you're using somebody else's Netflix account. It's right there. So at least give it both. Doing both right now. What's wrong with me? (laughs) (laughs) It's not like you guys like this movie more than the devil all the time. You guys seem like you guys like more forgiving, like, or not forgiving. You guys seem like you like just enjoyed it way more. I didn't, well, no, I, I didn't see that, to be fair. Oh, okay, I, okay, okay. No, I, Devil All the Time, I think, is a better film. Interesting. Like, oh, really? Okay. Like, oh. me personally, like, I'm trying to think what I... I think I gave Hillbilly Elegy, like, to me, I gave it, like, CC minus around there. Like, I definitely wouldn't call it, like, a disaster of a movie. Yeah. Well, well but, you know what, Shane? <laughs> <man? laughs> oh, 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 Sorry. Part, yeah. part, part of it might be that because I was going into it expecting to see a really bad film. So it was just, I. That's not what I, I, I was like, this is like the, the performances were really, really good. Like, I, think, I think maybe, I, I also, like I told you before, I have kind of a soft spot for family melodrama. And so it just mm-hmm. kind of like, I see my own family in a much less extreme way. You know, uh, we don't, there's no needles in the sink you know, uh, in this house, um, you know, but uh, some people can relate to that shit, you know, it's uh, yeah. the real thing. And, and uh, so I get, so I, I have a soft spot for that. So maybe that's why, you know. Now, Matt, do you have anything that you've watched recently that you want to give a quick shout out to? Uh, yeah. Um, so apparently this has been happening for a couple of years, like the Hollywood Reporters YouTube channel. They've been doing this thing called uh, round tables where they'll get like oh I love them so much yeah like these um like they'll get like a bunch of famous uh, screenwriters it's mostly movies not TV uh, or a bunch of people that uh, like directors or actresses or like people that are mostly met, like usually are inside of funny movies or there's even one where they got a bunch of like like a uh, production people so they have like netflix and like universal pick they have like a bunch of random stuff uh and they just have they just kind of just make them talk to each other and you just watch them i think that's pretty cool also the book for ready player two came out i didn't like i liked it i liked the first movie i like the first book i didn't like the movie i didn't pick it up yet but that came out this week yeah i know that came out recently i always watch those hollywood reporter roundtables and they had some interesting conversations at the directors one this past year because it was martin scorsese greta gerwig noel bombach mm-hmm. um crap what was the, guy the, city of god. the the what the guy that did city of god i forget the guy's name that guy was on there um, was that the same director who did, uh, Two Popes? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, yeah. Mm-hmm. And then, um, the director Joker, who did The Hangover. Um, yeah. And then, um, the director of The Farewell was on there. 
it was a very interesting mm-hmm. dynamic because they brought up comic book movies. And I was mm-hmm. waiting for somebody to bring that up with uh, Martin Scorsese sitting there. And <clears throat> there was some varying opinions there with it because like it's just like because I think one of them was offered one and didn't want to do it because she didn't want to get pigeonholed into that which is interesting because I know some of the especially some of the upcoming Marvel films are going to be done by some indie directors like the new Eternals film is from Chloe Zhao who has Nomadland coming out this December and did a film called The Rider but like there's some very interesting because like Todd Phillips was there he just did Joker and like he was riding high on that all billion dollars that Joker made Uh, (laughs) and yeah and it was very interesting because it was also interesting because there was an actual couple at the table because like Greta Gerwig and Noah Baumbach right. are partners and like it was interesting every time he talked like the way that like Greta Gerwig would like so attentively like listen to him and just be like smiling at him the whole time and he's just very much like he he just seems like the kind of guy that would have wrote Marriage Story and <laughs> I thought he was attentive to her Hmm? It, shows I, it shows what I know. I thought he was. I thought he was pretty, like you know, you know, he was like you know, listening to her. I don't know. I don't well, know. no, like he, like it was really interesting listening to Greta Gerwig talk because she was probably the most animated person at the table. Because like, and she has a passion for things, and like I loved Little Women and Lady Bird, and that was I always enjoy those roundtable talks. One of the most interesting ones was the director's one when Hacksaw Ridge came out and Mel Gibson was there. And because, so, like, he, he was a really animated and like engaged participant and it had really interesting things talking about. And the way that Denzel Washington looked at him the whole time and like you could tell when Denzel's not happy <laughs> and he just had like a look at him because like he directed Fences that year. So they're at the same table, but those are really cool things. So I appreciate you sharing that, Matt. I have one more. I love those too. I have one more I have to share with both of you. I don't know if you guys are big fans of Tony Scott. You know, he, you know, rest in peace. He had a hit or miss career. Mm -hmm. Uh, um, He, um, back in the early 2000s, I don't know if you knew about this, BMW hired on a bunch of like notable directors mm-hmm. to direct these short films to show off their cars at the time. Um, they're not commercials, but there is a lot of driving and yeah. show what the, the cars can do. Have you, did you, did you ever hear about this, Shane? I think so. This sounds familiar. Are you sure you're not talking about James Bond movies? Not James, no. <laughs> <laughs> right. The entire movie is for the car. That's half the reason they make the movie. <laughs> Tony Scott directed a 10-minute short starring... They all starred Clive Owen, by the way. This was mm-hmm. before Clive Owen... I guess it was right when Clive Owen was becoming Clive Owen. Yeah. And it's starring Clive Owen, Gary Oldman as the devil, and James Brown. Okay. So James Brown, rest in peace. He was still alive. And this, the plot of the movie is that James Brown has hired Clive Owen to race the devil in the desert so that James Brown could have 50 more years of being James Brown. It's the greatest thing I ever heard of in my life. It's if on- I heard an elevator pitch ever, that <laughs> an hell of an elevator pitch. <laughs> James Brown's being like, I trade the sunrise for the sunset. Got to get on a good foot. I need more time. You know, and Clive Owen's like, okay. (laughs) 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 It's it's, Gary Oldman is amazing. And the way it's shot and the way it's edited in that very like methamphetamine, like all over the place, Tony Scott style. Like, you know, if you're, if you're into that, if you like, I'm for some reason, I'm into cars nowadays. So if you're into that, it's like check it out. It's only ten minutes long, and somebody somebody remastered it in like 4K. 
that you, like you blow it up. It's a, it's a cool. It's a I'll cool. Have to check story. it out. <laughs> yeah, there's a bunch of them. There's like uh, I think Ang Lee directed one, and um, I think I haven't seen the one that John Woo did, but John Woo directed. Oh my god. So yeah. Are uh, there dubs? Um, I the dubs. Gotta be dubs. <laughs> Uh, Guy, Guy Ritchie did one with Madonna. I watched it. That one was actually pretty funny. Um, after they had broken up, so awkward. Um, so yeah, and it's like he lets her have it too. <laughs> so. I um I I rewatched The Gentleman because I just got it on Black Friday for really cheap, and I loved it even more the second time I watched it. When Guy Ritchie is on, he makes some firecracker movies like yeah. they pop and like when he's doing british gangster movies so great this one the cast is amazing but that's not what i was going to bring up but i'll definitely have to check that out i want to do a little plug for um, a new documentary called movie trailers a love story and this is actually directed by john campia who has his own youtube channel and i watch his videos almost every day and like, I've been watching his content since he was on AMC Movie Talk and Collider Movie Talk. And if you love movies and love to talk about trailers and think about trailers and like the state of trailers, it's a really interesting, well-structured documentary that really digs deep into different aspects of like, there's such a dialogue about trailers now because like, what do you give away? Or do they give up too much? Which like, if you're a Fast and Furious movie, they put out like multiple three and a half minute trailers and give away almost the whole entire movie. And uh, like they talk about Batman v Superman. Did they really need to show uh, Doomsday in those trailers and show past the point where they're teaming up now because, you know, they had their fight and they're good now. But like that kind of stuff or they sell you a different movie. They talked about Drive quite a bit because of the trailer for Drive was like a Fast and Furious movie. And it sure as hell not Drive. Um, <laughs> like I would bring up any A24 horror movie because they try to sell you a very traditional horror experience and <clears throat> you know anything about A24 horror movies, this is not going to be like your It scene. comes at night. Huh? I was like, it comes at night. Where's the zombie? Oh, okay. His paranoia. Are you saying the monster is humans all along? Paranoia <sighs> comes at night. Because <laughs> not to spoil anything, but like nothing literally comes at night, which they sold in the trailer. This looked like a zombie movie. And I'm just like, they sold that so bad. And the cine score for it's like an F or something because people were so pissed. <laughs> I love It Comes at Night. I think it's a really great film, but like it's not what the trailer painted it to be. Hereditary, they sold that movie way different than that movie turned out to be. Um, but that's a, something I want to bring up. And then there's one new HBO limited series called The Undoing. If you love yourself some really twisty, just... Like, it's not quite a soap opera, but it's like a really melodramatic, kind of erotic kind of thriller. And you, like, any kind of stuff like that. This is about, so Nicole Kidman, like a psychiatrist who's married to a pediatric doctor played by Hugh Grant. And all of a sudden, Hugh Grant turns out to be a very different kind of person, and his mistress winds up turned up, like, beat to death with like a hammer and this show is like there's twists and turns at every corner it's really 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 well acted like Hugh Grant's in like a whole golden age of his career at this point because like he's no longer like pigeonholed into like rom-coms like he was when he was younger and he does some great work in this Nicole Kidman Donald Sutherland's in it playing Nicole Kidman's very wealthy, powerful father. And my God, there's one scene in it where he's talking to the head of the, his grandson's school that I'm like, this is why Donald Sutherland's a legend. And like, there's some amazing acting. It'll keep you on your toes. I think it's six episodes. So it's like 
six hour long episodes it's on it's an hbo show so if you have hbo max it's all on there right now because it ended it's a it's a crazy one it's a crazy ride so just wanted to share that one where do you watch the first thing you said where do you watch that um it's a it's on vod so i rented it on amazon prime the movie trailers documentary i gotta gotta see that i want to check that out it's and it's like they talk to i won't give away too much but like some of the more interesting ones it's like um they talk they and they have such an interesting variety of people they talk to because they talk to people who professionally make trailers they talk to filmmakers, they talk to screenwriters, they talk to YouTubers who do trailer reactions. Cause like that's a whole entire genre of videos on YouTube now. So they talk to a couple of famous ones because like John Campion knows a lot of people in like the YouTube verse when it comes to movies. So like there's a great variety of people that he talks to. And like me personally who watches a lot of like the schmoes, um, John Campia, Collider, like I know, I know a lot of the people that are in the documentary because like I've watched these things and it was really interesting seeing them talking about trailers. Yeah, that is so, that's so freaking cool. The thing about Drive is really cool. And what you say about Batman v Superman, I think the first time I saw that trailer, it might've been with you guys when we went to see uh, Civil War. Mm-hmm. Um, that and makes I, sense. Or And I, I remember... I just was like, well, that seems like a f- clusterfuck. But the kids that were like nine, ten rows ahead of us went, whoa! And I'm like, oh, if I was a kid, I guess I'd really be into this. Like, well, I just. And that's a thing, too, because who were movie trailers made for? Mainstream audiences. Yeah. They're not made for us. Not gentlemen. Like, they're not made for. <laughs> <laughs> These Britons who want the whole movie told to them, how dare they? Um, like, for us, it's like, we love film. And I don't, like, honestly, perfect example, Blade Runner 2049. The first trailer said nothing about the story. Right. You couldn't tell what the hell the movie was about. Do but I was sold. Do they talk about Blade Runner? I, I don't know if they talked about that one specifically, but the idea of, like, if you don't give enough story, exactly. then people won't, most people won't go to see it. Blade Runner probably would have benefited from, you know, know you know, knowing um, slightly related, but, you know, once upon a time in Hollywood was, success, was successful because everybody was attached to it. But that's one you kind of want to know what you're getting into because if you don't know anything, you're like, "Oh, that's who it was." Like, yeah, man. Like, read something. <laughs> read something before you go see this movie. You know, get you know because because you know uh, it's a little bit more complex. So, so. Well, and that's an interesting example because I feel like if you're not going to sell it based off of here's the Tarantino movie, okay, you all want to see it. Yeah. How do you market Once Upon a Time in Hollywood? Because a lot of the we, film... That movie doesn't get made if it's not Tarantino. No. But if, but if, if you're talking about Blade Runner, a movie that was all re- franchise that already wasn't successful, you know, you've got to work on, like, getting people, you know, into... And, you know, the funny thing is that they, they did... A, once again, another really similar to what I was talking about before with the Tony Scott thing... They had shorts that they made on YouTube. You probably knew about that. They had shorts made by different directors. Mm-hmm. You know, one was an anime, you know, that took place right after the first Blade Runner movie. You know, so they did take a very artistic approach, but they didn't want anybody to know about the specifics of the plot. And so, Which... you know, the, the question is if people would know people kind of knew like you're going to see Harrison Ford here and this is what's going to happen there would it have made a difference in the box office I don't know would it's it have- <laughs> Blade Runner 2049 is a hard sell kind of movie a hard science fiction that was made for 175 million dollars so like 
how vile like Warner Brothers didn't make the smartest decision. And I'm worried about Dune for that very reason. Because like the first trailer for Dune, I don't really know what this movie's about. Like I've read Dune. So like I know what it's about. But it's it's hard because like how much do you give away? I remember when the trailers for Fury Road came out. And like to be fair how much plot is there for you to really give out for Blade, uh, for Mad Max Fury Road? It's like, it's the setup, and then go. And, like, the first trailer said nothing about the story at all, and it was just, like, the that classical music, that boisterous classical music, and just, like, all the craziness, and just, like, I rewatched the trailer after I watched this documentary, and I'm like, oh. I remember seeing that trailer for the first time and being like, like, I'm sold. But like a lot of people are like, what the hell is this? And it's fair. But like, that's why I don't watch a whole lot of trailers anymore. Cause like, to be honest, I'm going to watch most things anyway. So you don't really need to sell me on it. Sure. But like, there's certain things like, <laughs> did I go and watch the Dune trailer when that dropped? Hell Yes. I went and watched the Doom trailer <laughs> and like they talk about um, this nature of like there's 30 minutes of trailers before movies now and like my god it's a lot of trailers it's too much it's too much yeah, I remember seeing one we were going to see Troy with my grandfather you know it was probably like 15 minutes of trailers he leans over my brother's like there's only one more right and there was like five more trailers you know, and, you know so it's uh yeah. Well, and like with the big movies, they show nine or ten trailers, and it's legitimately thirty minutes. And I'm just like, and the how much I go to the movies in normal times, I see those trailers again and again and again, <laughs> and some of them I like groan when they start playing again and some of them have been embedded in me so well because they're so such great trailers that like I remember when the favorite came out and like every time that trailer came on I'm like yes because like I enjoyed the trailer so much and like the trailer for Vice with the song The Man by The Killers I'm like I was ready and they talk about songs and trailers too a lot and they even talked about one of my favorites, which was uh, Mission Impossible Fallout with uh, Friction by Imagine Dragons. Oh, every time that trailer came on, I'm like, yes, I was ready for it. But it's cool when you finally see a trailer that you've been waiting your whole life to see. Like the first time you saw the X Men trailer, the first X Men, it was like, I have been waiting my whole life. <laughs> That's what I thought about the Simpsons movie. I was like, oh man, like it's actually, I'm literally sitting in the theater watching a Simpsons movie. It's crazy. Force <laughs> Awakens. When that trailer came out, I'm like, and like Endgame and like Infinity Wars trailers. I remember when Endgame's trailer came out because what they left you with after Infinity War, I'm just like, what the hell is this going to be? And they gave every you single movie, Marvel movie was like an event. Like every time a trailer came out, that was like like people would like gather around like your like your phone or your laptop. Mm -hmm. Like oh crap! Like Civil War, Spider Man. What? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, and they even talk about how Marvel lies in their trailers because they CGI out certain things so they don't give away certain stuff. Wow. And like, is it ethical? Or is it a good thing because they keep surprises? Because, like, I even remember um, the in Endgame trailers gave away nothing. Like, nothing. And there's even one shot of Rocket walking into, like, this seaside house. And he looks by himself walking into the room. When you see it in the movie, they CGI'd Professor Hulk out of it. Because they didn't want to give away the fact that, like, he was Professor Hulk now and, like, not only like he was Banner and Hulk at the same time and they didn't want to give that away so they just didn't CGI him in the shot so like stuff like that they have a whole section on that so I've oversold this documentary you should go watch it <laughs> um but 
this was a fun time. I know this has been a uh, one extra week since we've actually done a show together. So it's happy to have the ga- gang back together doing this one. And we'll be back in two weeks for another episode of Development Hell Podcast. But thank you all for tuning in and supporting Alex, Matt, and myself, your Wasteland reviewer. And thank you as always. And we'll see you again soon. Later, guys.